I want to talk about design patterns for data pipelines, and I probably should have called it data integrations, because I think we should be distinguishing those two things, but I could not resist the alliteration and the, the frequency of how much people talk about data pipelines, as if they're the only thing that exists anymore. And design patterns, nobody seems to talk about anymore. Um, when I came up in the Java world, when I first moved to San Francisco and Martin Fowler and them were coming up with design patterns, this was a really great thing for software engineers. Uh, coming up with ways of organizing your objects and relationships to them and characteristics they had. So if somebody wanted to solve a certain kind of problem, it was possible that a factory or a singleton would solve their problem. They had really good documentation about how a factor, what kinds of problems a factory might solve or a singleton. And when you named it that, other developers were like, oh yeah, factory. I, I get what that is. It's not, it makes immediate sense. And we don't have as many I've, I've argued, for, I did argue for 10 years that my manager should not interview people in Python and quiz them on design patterns. But I've come to the point where I miss design patterns, and it's specifically in the area of very complex software integrations. So that's design patterns, and data pipelines you all know. And by the way, this slide was um, generated perfectly well <laughs> by an AI. <laughs> And if you can have an AI perfectly explain to you what extract, transform, load are for and what they do, then it's probably too simplistic for the complex problems we really encounter. So um, I want to talk about how I blew up our data pipeline. For the last seven uh, years, I was at a startup, and we were providing compensation, strategy, and workflow software. So in order to do this, we needed to get information from HRIS. If you've ever worked in HR software, it's not great. Um, most of the APIs were not APIs. We often had to get CSVs. Even the APIs had a bunch of problems. We also had to get data from other systems, like stock administration systems, uh, and from just spreadsheets that our customers had. So. It really was a mess, and over time, I built up a software architecture that had dealt with it a lot more smoothly, a lot more gracefully, but it took a lot of time to build towards this. If um, you managed to get on the QR code or see the purity test that I handed around earlier, um, there's 38 questions in the <laughs> version I put online, and my company checked all of them. Did anybody do this? What's the high score out there? Did anybody else get above 30? Still working on it. Still working on it. Shout out a number later. I'll know what you mean. I can't count them. Yeah. <laughs> anybody get a score? You got a 24. No? Yeah. You're, you're, our, our friend at dinner got a 24. Yeah, I stopped counting over 20. Yeah, over 20. Yeah, complicated data integrations. Including bonus points for breaking things on production, you know? <laughs> You may not have appreciated getting that high score, but at least you get a high score. That's your prize. Um, the topics I want to go into, I, I worked really hard to kind of put them into a narrative, a flow, a story, and the end I gave up in the last few things are a bit of a um, mishmash at the very end. Um, but those are the topics I want to talk about. I want to talk about where the widely available uh, advice did not really help me come to an architecture that other people coming into my company could understand, um, and the code patterns we found useful, and some process patterns that we did find useful also. So what is wrong with extract, transform, load? It sounds so simple. It sounds like just three steps. And by the way, what is with the pipeline metaphor? It sounds like your stuff just flows. All you have to do is open the tap and your data will just flow, right? Like butter. <laughs> Um, some of the steps I have here in small print are like things like renaming columns, splitting values into multiple columns that are glommed together as strings in one column, reformatting things. In the question mark thing, the things that don't fit into either, even in the big buckets of extract or transform or load, are some things like testing your data for whether it has required columns, seeing a diff of what would change, um, saving, a, saving a snapshot um, as you go. All kinds of steps that you end up doing in a complicated pipeline, and there's no really good place for them to fit. Does ELT help? I don't think ELT helps complicated 
data integrations. And, and why can't we get some more letters? <laughs> Marketing has bigger budgets. I know I've seen the big websites around ELT and they still have only the three letters. Do DAGs help? Yes, DAGs really help in that you need to understand where the required flow of steps is. You need to think in terms of a, a series of steps and some of them must come before other steps. And if, um, I'd learned about, if I'd learned about tools that used DAGs and really thought about them earlier in the seven years, I probably would have borrowed some tricks from that, build my own decorators saying, this step must come before this step. Um, because sometimes we would write code that would move steps around and then something else would break. And that's exactly the kind of thing that thinking in terms of what does this look like if I drew it as a, as a, as a directed acyclic graph would help you avoid. Um, a lot of it, however, is just linear. So I didn't find it helped a lot. A lot of our steps could be done in a number of, I, I could, it's an uncountable number of different orderings that would have been valid in our code and only some of them are wrong. Uh, does change data capture help? Sure, we did this. It doesn't, it's not a panacea for the, all the other problems, but it's nice to have. Um, we used Django Simple History, by the way. Um, it does add complexity. Uh, one thing to consider is whether you can add it later, or whether you can do a simple version of it. It shouldn't be, if you're doing a complex data integration, the kind that gets you a lot of points on the purity test, it's probably not your top concern. Um, this is not an architecture, but I found that Jupyter was anti-architecture. I, I, I love it and I learned to use it and I appreciated it and then I stepped back because I found that the times when I wanted to use it was when I was exploring some brand new data. Like I was exploring census data and uh, government salary numbers for a while and investigating a, something we could do with our product. And I pulled out the Jupyter and I was really glad I had that tool set. But then every time I was working with our actual production data, our customer exports from HRISs and the spreadsheets they gave me, I found it was antithetical to building automation. Uh, it's hard to document Jupyter stuff, it's hard to share, it's um, hard to write testing around it. You, you're just in a mode of exploration. It draws you into this DF transform and then another DF transform and then another DF transform and then you think, well, I've got this, so I'll just move on to the next problem and cut and paste from my last problem and yeah. So my proposal is how about some plain old software architecture, some design patterns around this. The little subliminal message, <laughs> I can't, can't say that phrase, uh, on the um, sticky notes is work on your code architecture. And we all know what some of the characteristics of this is. Modular software. Modular software is great. It's easier to test, it's easier to name, it's easier to keep separate from other code, it's easier to maintain. If you have good information hiding around your modules, like my um, English accented software engineering professor used to say, and I still hear it in his accent, right? Information hiding. Um, then it, it, it really helps you maintain that and deal with the complexity. And when your Bamboo API changes, it's, you're fine. It's just the Bamboo code that you've had to change because of your, you've, you've done some good architecture. Um, and in particular, that's one of the things we did early on. We realized we've got all these incoming HRIS systems with their different CSVs or APIs. One of the smartest things we did was to build an internal format that we could translate all those incoming formats to the earliest possible version, even if it had extra rows. It had like, for example, it had bonus amount because some systems gave us bonus amount and it had bonus percent because some systems gave us bonus percent. And th but that's all right. We just needed to get it to this common internal format, even if it was somewhat sparse, and then start doing the next set of transformations on top of that because that gave us reuse for all of the things in the generic transformer. And when we needed to use things um, common across all those specific transformers, we had them inheriting from an abstract base transformer for things like file operations that we wanted to do the same way every way. 
like for example, we did use pandas and data frames, and yet and we loaded data frames in the same way from CSVs, and we saved them out the same way in checkpoints. Um, along with your large testable steps, and we did have large tests that would test from the beginning of transforming a batch to the end of transforming a batch, does it look about right? We also had lots and lots of small testable steps. And I found it very easy to write those tests, those steps to be hard to test. And we quickly worked to build our internal patterns of making those small steps be easy to test. So the small step of finding out if an asset is a non-physical asset should be its own step. It should be named. It's much easier to read that way. And it should be testable. Um, I didn't actually cut and paste code from our project, so if there's any errors in it, it's because I had to make it up to not actually cut and paste code. But it's very close. Um, sorry, a bit of a random jump here. Throw bad data away. Don't be a data hoarder. We were data hoarders, and I quickly got punished for trying to hoard data. Um, the longer you keep something around because you might need it later, the more costs you pay maintaining it. If you keep around rows that you don't need, well, I learned this, for example, trying to keep around rows for interns. I was like, well, we might handle interns later or contractors, so we'll keep those rows. But then as you keep them and send them to the next transformer step and the next transformer step, well, those are bad. Those rows that you don't need are more likely to have weird data that you don't handle. So now you have to add complexity to your transformer to handle data you don't even need in the first place. Throw it away. Because you would keep the first copy you downloaded from the customer, right? You've got that one. You can always go back to it. And I've got another few tricks that make it easier to go back to that. Throwing data away means get it out of this pipeline today. It's still there. You, even if I was really throwing things away like PII, we would throw away personally identifying information very early in the pipeline before saving it to disk. The next time you get data from the customer, you can reacquire that if suddenly you need that PII. Um, and now I contradict myself because I talk about keeping data, but really it's a different thing. Keeping all this data, keeping all this checkpoint data is, uh, oh, a lovely thing. For one thing, you're saving the things that you threw away in case you know next month somebody says, can you add a feature that has somebody's state? And you say, but I'm not saving state, but you know, fine, it's easy for me to add in state, and then you'll have state. Um, somebody's state or county or whatever. Uh, you can even go back to the last little few weeks of uh, customer imports and start working from the checkpoint data you saved from your customer endpoints and really quickly write yourself some test-driven development use cases. Say, well, I know the data looks like this. It looks like this by the time it gets to our generic transformer. Um, I can run through, I can add a step to our transformer and before we know it, we're, we're saving county and state or whatever it is extra that we needed for some new feature. Uh, these are the t places in our product where we chose to save checkpoint batches. And by the way, our, our, our data was very batch dependent. It was just too hard to, Im to import batches, to import individual records and work on record-oriented stuff because we were getting it in batches anyways. It all had to come through anyways. It was no bueno to try to import somebody and their manager had left and not raise an error or, uh, you know, it just, it just was worse if we tried to do record-oriented stuff. Idempotence is another thing that makes this whole thing go easier. Idempotence makes it easier to go back and say, well, I, I want to run that step again. I want to run it again. I want to run, run again. I'm going to add you know, checkpoints to the code. I'm going to add breakpoints to the code, I mean. I'm going to add print statements to the code. Run it again. Run it again. You debug the problem pretty fast when you can run the same thing over and over again without having to reset anything. And if you design your steps that way from the first, from the first then you've just given that gift for you to, to your future debugging sessions and all your other teammates. So we, and it's really easy to make things not be idempotent when you're just sorting stuff out for the first time. When people start using Jupyter stuff, you've, it's rarely idempotent, right? You're rare, yeah, people just start naturally putting stuff into Jupyter that quickly invalidates prior assumptions and they go back to another place and suddenly it doesn't work. That's because they haven't been doing every step rigorously in, a, in an idempotent way. 
that's fine. Jupiter's great at exploring. But when you start checking things in, we always we started asking, all right, is this new step we're checking in idempotent? We tried our best to have idempotence at many layers, which means slightly different things. Idempotence at the step layer often means that it's just returning result to the parent code rather than modifying the data and returning that to the parent code. Do you know what I mean? If you pass a function like filter route terminated employees to a subfunction, it could modify the data frame, pass it back, and now you're passing it to the next thing. That is harder to test and not idempotent, and it's harder to move around if its order technically wouldn't matter, but the way you've implemented it, it does. Uh, so thinking about that at many layers was also very useful. So you've probably noticed a reconcile step I've thrown in there. That was one of the major things where I like, does not fit in extract, it does not fit in transform. I def load is definitely too late to be doing this. Reconcile is the step where we started checking against valid values. So if a company had people in zones, um, you know, zone one, zone two, zone three, and I knew to map like Salt Lake City to zone two and Seattle to zone one, um, I needed to reconcile a, the zone information for employees against those cities that I knew and, or those zones that I knew, and if they didn't exist, to, to raise errors. Um, we, we had some um, heuristic code, like if 90% of the employees are not in a valid zone, stop everything. Uh, if only 10% are not in a valid zone, that's business as usual. <laughs> uh, it's not good, folks. The way companies pay people, yeah. Um, our customers were, of course, amazing, but that's because we helped them to be. Um, if I were to do this again, I would put a test step earlier. Like I said, throw bad data away early, and I would love for test and rejection to be an earlier step. Uh, maybe in the middle of transform, if you need to do some transformation steps before doing some test, which is why I was trying to come up with like good acronyms to replace ETL, like, like Ferris or Tetris or something that would have fetch and extract and test and transform, and there were too many T's, and I never figured out something really awesome, but I'm still working on it. It'll be an awesome acronym someday. <laughs> um, and the TBDAAE is my short form for throw bad data away early. And early means whenever you, whenever you get a chance to notice that it's bad data. If you don't notice until reconcile or until just before load that it's bad data, it's still a good time to throw it away. Oh, we finally reconciled this employee, and we realized that they're in zone, um, you know, India, and the company didn't give a, doesn't want us handling India employees, so we'll throw that bad, bad data away at the very last step before load. That's still a good time. Um, when we got to the load step, if we were working on improving our processes, if we were, or if we were doing something manually, if we were working on a customer for the first time or the first few times, we would do imports manually. And I, I started out thinking Django import export looked good. I started to hate it. And then I figured out how to use it well. And then I started to love it again. And at this point, I would, I would recommend Django import export because if, if only for one thing, which is that if you're using Django and you're importing data, you get these super powerful diffs. You can see, and I, I, had, a, I had to like gank somebody's example off the web with this, this hello example of, they're changing the title of every record to hello. Well, that's probably because they were putting hello in some test, in some code to figure out where a bug was, and they forgot to take that out when they started working on something else. And you go and look at this diff, and you're like, I've still got hello in every title. Good thing I noticed that before hitting OK and putting it into production. Diffs are amazing. Um, it really helped uh, debug processes as we were working on them and uh, save us from errors going into production. The, they're easy to, to avoid too. We also wrote code that would, once we got a customer and their brand new HRIS that we'd never seen before, once we started working with it and getting their data working well, then we'd move it into automated um, status and then our data refreshes would start from the data we got from the customer and then go through all the steps one by one in series. We could always go back and redo any of them because even when automated, we were still saving those checkpoints. And then we would bypass the diff 
using Django import export to get it into the production database. And lo and behold, we had employees, new managers, and new grades, and new salaries. Is that still good? Yeah. All right. Um, while I'm talking about Django import export, your import architecture may interact with your export architecture. It could. It's nice to be able to export code or export data and then be able to import it into another system, right? Super useful. We would have developers and not wanting them to like debug on production, we'd be able to take an error that was occurring for a customer, export that data, uh, that data developer would import it and then being extremely responsible developers, they would clean it from their systems entirely and they'd say, well, I don't have that customer data anymore, so I'll have to reacquire it to debug the next thing, which is fine. I loved how uh, responsible Amy was in particular. Um, and for this, I did notice that direct, like the, the automatic data serializers, and one was talked about earlier today with um, Pydantic, right? It was a data serializer with types and all of that. Those have their place and we also use those, but for uh, complex data, serializers are not great. Uh, they only work at a point in time when your schema is exactly that. And then they don't work well when you've added columns, removed columns, renamed columns, reinterpreted columns, or any other thing. They don't work well across systems because they typically use PKs unless you've been really um, responsible and defined, instead of using PKs, defined natural IDs for all your objects that refer to each other, and it's easy to uh, move fast and just define PKs. Well, I actually think a better way than using these automatic serializers is to do the do the architectural and data modeling effort to define, an inter to define a format that works for you for exporting and importing that's ideally more human readable than what the automatic serializer would find, would, would be able to do for you. This is interface work. And we talk about modules and information hiding and uh, all the good stuff that makes our code extensible and adaptable. And a lot of that comes down to good interface design. In importing and exporting work, that file format is your interface. We went with CSV, by the way. We decided. Like Django import export lets you do XML, CSV, and four other things. And we turned all of that off and just went with CSV. In the limit, when something was wrong, it was so, e so easy to look at a CSV and say, what went wrong in this export? Back it out, or this import, back it out, look at the CSV, pull it into Excel, fig pull something else the customer gave us into Excel, and find out where the differences are, and go like, there's the error. We're getting it on these employees. We're only getting it on the India employees. Did they give us a bad uh, con conversion rate and quickly narrow down the problem? And, that's, and, and, and having it in CSV, even with CSV's problems, and I'm super annoyed at CSV's formatting problems and lack of comments and things like that. We lost it. Who was gonna tell me when, huh? There we go. Even though our canonical format for exports and imports was CSV, it worked fine. We, again, I had those, the, the code and things like the abstract transformer to say, this is the way we load a CSV. This is the way we save a CSV. Use these methods. We never used any other methods. We actually used pandas read CSV and write CSV, but we wrapped them in our own. And we're gonna deal with comment rows this way. We stripped them out ourselves. And we're gonna deal with um, canonicalizing header case this way. We put that all into our one single used everywhere in our import export code, read CSV and save CSV wrappers. Uh, and that's the slide I just explained without actually being on it. It was really a, a feature development win to have this, this stable format between different um, between different systems, like being able to move data off of production and onto a de developer's machine and then delete it without worrying about it after they'd finished debugging and being able to move. Um, sometimes we would do a whole new feature on 
a, on a, a version of production that we could clone data to, so it would be real live production data, but with the brand new features before we rolled out them out to production, a lot of it worked because of these stable format import and export files. Um, mockable data. Sure, mocks are great. Oh, and by the way, I hope we've gotten to the point where you realize that testing these things, I said before, testing the small things is important, testing the big loops is important. Um, having good test data is important. And, you know, the more, the more tests are concise, readable, uh, and easy to write, the better you are at, going, at, at having uh, good test coverage of this stuff and keeping it stable as things are constantly shifting under you, right? Um, and one of the tricks I really liked was that we started making everything we did handle rows as dicts. And sure, that's not a mock. It's even easier to read than a mocked thing. We usually didn't need to assert anything else about the mock other than the incoming row had this event date and the outgoing row had this event date uh, or that it was marked as not, do not keep or added the flag of terminated equals true to it. Um, so that ended up uh, being super useful in writing our tests. We had some very long objects though. Our employee records had like 50, 80 fields on the employee object. Cool. Yep. Um, and so we would build these uh, models in tests with simple methods that built a dictionary and then overrode values. So if I wanted to build a, a, a test for decommissioned assets, I would call the decommissioned asset creator, which would call the basic simple asset creator. And if I wanted to override um, the certifier and make that an empty field, nobody certified decommissioning this asset we should flag an error, then it was really easy to override individual uh, values with this approach. Super readable. Um, since we used Django, uh, I found something that was really great, again, to modularize, to divide, to conquer, to, do, to split things up and put different responsibility into different areas was to use Django signals, which means, um, you know, the one we used most often was post-save. <laughs> after you save, here are the things you can do after you save. So we would do, um, and this is a thing that made me able to use Django import-export with keeping my sanity, because uh, we were trying to use Django import-export for too many things. We were trying to do transforms inside our Django DIE, I'm just going to call it DIE now. We were trying to do, you do transforms inside our DIE resources, and that made them too complicated. And we were trying to do this model link up where an employee model would have the PK for their manager model, and so that the joins would be fast, and that their department would be right, and that their zone would be right, and all these, their location ID would be right. All of these relations we were trying to set up in the import with the DIE resource, and it made those resources really hard to do and have lots of custom code. So we stopped doing that and started doing more and more of that work in post-save signals. It was terrific, because then we could have something that stood by itself, right? A, a signal that you can run after saving an employee is like, and now fix up their manager ID. But So we'd import the employee with a manager, an imported manager ID, we just made it a new column. Here's your imported manager ID, employee, uh, and then in the post save, it would go like say, all right, when the imported manager ID is different from the old manager ID, we change it. And uh, it's pretty easy to make that code very robust and work reliably. Um, we, we, we ended up following that pattern more and more. Uh, closing advice. I didn't miss anything, did I? I couldn't, I stopped being able to see the screen except if I come around here. So I don't think I missed anything. Um, which will leave us lots of time to question, for questions and to get home early, which if you're cold, I apologize. I understand, I'm empathetic. It's nice hopping around up here a little bit. I'm keeping, keeping warm. Um, I ended up feeling, talking to a lot of people about this and thinking a lot about it, that a lot of the information we get out there is marketing. And we get, 
you know, you go searching for uh, data pipeline architecture, data integration architecture, you get so much on ETL and ELT, and so much of it would not have helped any of my problems. My problems were the kind of problems you needed good old software architecture to solve a lot. Um, not always, I probably could have benefited from some tools that I never learned about, but who knows what the cost of that would be. How, how many tools should I have evaluated? Because evaluating them all and getting past the marketing hype is so much work. It's work I don't have a lot of patience for either. So understanding what kind of problem you have, is, that's where I came to the data integration purity test, by the way. Um, it's the, it's, it, is, it is a joke, but the seed of the idea is also for something more serious. I would love to put together, with, the, with input from other people, uh, a scorecard for data integration complexity or, or type so that you can answer a few questions, a few branching questions about whether your data integration problem is real time or async. Is it batch oriented or is it record oriented? Is it create and update only or is it create only or is it create and update? Um, you know, is there human messy data in the pipeline? All of these things which, when you know about your problem, will guide you to what kind of solution you want if we talked about it that way. And calling everything a data pipeline oversimplifies, flattens something that is not flat in reality. So understanding your problems and understanding what problems are solved by what tools is really critical. Build with software architecture principles. If you write tests, as you probably know, you can refactor. We've refactored so much. Uh, we had un you know, a little bit of the state where this part of the code looked really good and was the way we wanted, and this was less so, and this was really significantly older. But a lot of the time, we were able to like, OK, we've got to work on the workday stuff again. We'll bring it up to our current minimum bar of, of what we'd like to work with now. And so the whole team got to, you know, contributed to refactoring and making better and making ourselves happier engineers. Uh, so testing is, is, is that important, the testing and the refactoring, as you all know, I hope, goes together so well. My last piece of advice for tonight and for always is thank your organizers. <laughs> organizers make the world go round. Like there's so much work that's not paid for by a company and yet somebody's putting it together. It's in their workplace or it's not. It's in a club or a committee or a council or a conference and organizers make it happen. Um, especially I wanted to say Phoebe Polk really stepped up this year to organize Pi Bay and never had done it before. And I'm so thankful she did it. I'm glad to be here in front of you. So thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, James. Thank you. Um, oh no, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I know there are other people who stepped up, Mara, and I've forgotten another name, but um, I, it, when I see that person, I'll know it and I'll tell them I appreciate them. So, and thank you all for staying so late in the cold. Are there any questions, since I know we have time? you used to essentially uh, validate the final production data, right? Essentially, because the business logic is already changing, the data is already changing, always changing, and you have unit tests for like column validation and stuff, but how do you make sure that somebody, a junior engineer making a formula change is not corrupting production data or messing up the sanity of the system? Right, so your question is, if I have some tests, how do I make sure that an engineer is not messing that up with their new code? Or particularly, I think with the production, final production data, right? You you have some initial data, you have you have some final data, uh, and there is some business logic in between. As the business logic is changing in between, how do you make sure that uh, the data is same? No, no, yeah, that goes back to what I described as a. Um, Final, is this going to go back if I do it? Is it going to go back? It's not back too far. Um, this. 
This really, really helped because when you have an import format that is the last format you use before you say, okay, import it, pull it into my production database, then that format can handle a lot of change. Uh, people add a feature, and that's fine if they add a feature. Does it need a new column? It's fine if they add a new column. Your import handles that with or without that new column. You don't go back and break the data that worked last week. We noticed that and talked about it if somebody proposed doing that. And you rename a column and I say like, okay, that's great, but why don't you also accept the old name? And then there's just no issue. So much of it just continued working because we had a stable import format. Something I uh, know very intuitively from having worked a long time with internet standards, that when that stuff is stable, you know very quickly how to add to it and remove from it while staying consistent. And it was also a terrific check. Like when that is the last format you have before data gets put into your production system, you know exactly what got put up there. That got put up there. We always saved copies of that off. Oh, here's a file coming into our production system. Save it off to Google Cloud Storage and apply it. So we always had a copy and knew exactly what somebody had imported. And it was really easy. It was always in the format that slowly evolved, but was basically manage recent versions of data were manageable with recent versions of code. Is that, I think, yeah, it worked great. Any more questions? Yeah, all right. I've been asking a couple tonight, that's great. Why not? Um, I have a question of, if you have an ETL pipeline mm -hmm. where the transformation is kind of complex or requires some sort of subject matter experience that the data pipeline engineers themselves don't have, do you have mm. any general, specific or general ways on how you can like handle a situation like that? No, I don't, okay. off the top of my head. We had a very tight-knit group, and our data engineer was in, you know, in training to be a software engineer, and so she came to really intimately understand the needs of the transform and stuff like that. Um, I expect it would help some to have that stable import format. Um, it is, a, it is a challenge in very complex data to, to know like, what's appropriate. To, like, to, to take a look at a vesting schedule and see if it makes sense, <laughs> right? That was a hard one. Hey, Lisa, thanks. Uh, oh, great Mike. talk. Uh, question. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, how to effectively get started with testing the data? Um, because there's so many different pieces of it. and, and Pipelines, I know we're not supposed to use that word now, uh, but, but in, in the pipelines, there's a lot of places to plug in. So how did you make choices about mm -hmm. where to scale your test development and stuff like that? Well, that's, yes. So I like to, um, I'm often test driven, doing test driven development, but not always. And importing is a place where we did code cub testing and found that while our overall test levels were at about 75% in our product code, our import area, that whole part, it was a part, it was a whole Django app just so we could keep it isolated, quarantined, right? No, um, <laughs> was at 55%. And it started way lower because when we would first write some import code, we would just get it working, check it in. And we knew since we were babysitting it initially, it would be fine. So we took on a new customer, we took on a new HRIS, Paylocity, for example. We wrote some really bad code to handle Paylocity, but it worked. Um, that we got the customer onboarded, we saw their next week's stuff, we modified our Paylocity thing, still didn't have any tests, and then typically the test start, tests would start coming the first time somebody would hit a bug or need to refactor. I always put in tests when I need to refactor, so I'd, I'd tackle the Paylocity and stuff and go like, well now we have a second customer using Paylocity and now I've learned that it's, this customer was weird and <laughs> You look, yeah, you, when you only have one customer using one format, you can handle it completely idiosyncratically. And then as soon as you have another customer using the same format, you don't want to write a whole new importer for the second customer, you end up having to do uh, more abstract things and more logic. And so that's often when I would add a test to make sure the first customer kept working, and then I'd modify the logic so the second customer would start working and tests grew from there. So over time, as we added more customers using the same version of a pipeline, or if we hit regressions, anytime we broke something in production, it was always like, how do we fix this in the data pipeline so we never 
break the production with data again, and how do we fix the feature code so that this kind of data doesn't break it again, and do we have regression tests for those two things? Any more questions tonight? Yeah. Hi, um, maybe just tangential, tangential, but um, could you give any advice around uh, time sensitive uh, intake uh, jobs? Like, you know, uh, the first of the month you want to mm -hmm. get the new payroll numbers or something like that, um, using cron or using something mm -hmm. else? Um, we weren't that that time sensitive. Um, we generally imported stuff on Mondays and then did other stuff the rest of the week um, and got it down to Monday mornings and then did stuff the rest of the week. Uh, and we took Mondays, if, if Monday was a holiday, it didn't get done until Tuesday. So I actually found that um, people who thought they wanted real time ended up never complaining about it afterward. They it turned out to be real time enough. Um, we, we probably would have gone to every day with even more automation, but I still don't think it would have mattered much what time of day. I think frequency might matter more than exact time eventually. But it depends on your use case. You might have something where really you want to grab the values at midnight, not before, not after. I don't know. Any more questions? All right, give it up for Lisa, everybody. Thank you, everybody.